Today, will the Bitcoin bubble burst? Part two. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to this post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. So it's my great pleasure to introduce you what some have called the godfather of crypto, Michael Turpin. Hi, Michael. Hello, pleasure to be here. It's great to have you on. And uh, look, you've been actively involved in the crypto world for a long, long time, an evangelist, an advocate, and, and clearly you've got a vision for how the digital economy is going to work in the future. I'd like to start there, if I, if I may, um, because this is more than just Bitcoin. It's more than just a digital currency, isn't it? Uh, digital really started with uh, you know the pocket calculator and uh, you know the the seventies and eighties where people started doing things that were historically analog for hundreds or thousands of years and put them into digital format and every single adoption period has been tough. Uh, I remember when the uh, first mobile phones came out and they were the size of very large bricks and they cost several thousand dollars a piece and unless you were a really high end salesman you never would have thought about getting one. Now there's more uh, phones in the uh, uh, the um, in in the world than than than, than people and than, than toilets. So um, you know that that's that that's been a change that's happened over the last thirty years, and uh, you wouldn't have predicted it from the first big bricks that we're carrying around. Uh, same thing with the personal computer. When the personal computer came out, uh, people scoffed at the idea that everybody would have one in a home, like Bill Gates has said. What are you going to do? Like, is your wife going to store recipes on it? You already have one at work. And so, you know, similarly with the web, uh, why do you want to blog? Similarly with social media, who cares what you had for breakfast? And these things that were scoffed at in the beginning, like the automobile, are now, you know, uh, indispensable. And so I believe the same thing is going to happen with digital assets. So digital assets are different than the web 1.0, which was, you know, um, websites and then blogs uh, really was an innovation because it let you go and um, be, have a worldwide printing press at your disposal. People had to know where to find you and Google saw that and Facebook, you know, connected you with other people. But the ability to go and print something once and have it copied a billion times had never happened before in human history. That unfortunately is not a good uh, characteristic of money or value. And so what uh, the blockchain is, and Bitcoin invented the blockchain, uh, is, uh, is scarcity, is to be able to have provable value where, you know, if I take a picture of you and I put it on Facebook, a billion people can have it. Whereas if I send you one unit of a digital currency, um, it's provable that I sent it to you and you have it and I no longer have it. So that's, that's the foundation of both, uh, you know, kind of, the commodity value, the digital gold that Bitcoin is, as well as smart contracts that the Ethereum has and, uh, you know, a number of other things that are now disrupting uh, enterprise technology and other traditional industries. Right. And you've been directly involved with BitAngels. You've now got uh, 500 international investors. Uh, what do you think the cornerstone concept behind the investment is? Is it is it you know, making money or is it revolutionizing the way that things work? I think it's a little bit of both and it depends what the, the time frames are. There are equity investors, um, uh, you know, in our group uh, who are looking at the, your traditional seven to 10 year uh, exits and they get in. Uh, you know, to buy into an exchange or to some kind of uh, enterprise that they, they, they think is going to, you know, 10x uh, and they're going to have a board seat, et cetera. And there's other ones that are, you know, tokens that uh, will trade and, you know, they're hoping that the, the difference between a hedge fund and a venture capital fund, they have different time parameters. But, uh, you know, both of these are, are investments that have uh, proven to be profitable over the last uh, 10 years, uh, you know, with very good comparisons to the stock market. Mm. And and presumably some of those investors are the big end of town, you know, the major financial players as well as um, private uh, individuals. Well, the major financial players um, didn't get into it until very recently. Mm. Um, JB Diamond said about four years ago that uh, Bitcoin was a fraud and that he would fire anybody who was stupid enough to buy it. Now, the, now, now they tell their best clients that they should have at least 
one percent of the portfolio in Bitcoin as a uh, hedge against uh, money printing and uh, and as a uh, portfolio driver uh, because it's outperformed the markets. Now it'd be nice if they had told it uh, to their best clients when it was uh, two hundred dollars instead of forty thousand. But uh, you know they're they're late to the game, but uh, they're, they're they seem fully. Uh, involved now uh, Goldman Sachs just this past week set in custody uh, about two significant state uh, stake in uh, circle which is a uh, US based cryptocurrency exchange and so they've been slowly kind of like you know taking baby steps and I think we'll, uh, a couple things that were just critical this year that really helped power this this current bull market other than just the timing and the fundamentals of Bitcoin uh, you know cutting its supply of new Bitcoin in half every four years, and usually about a year and change afterwards with, with an assumption of linear demand growth, which has been happening uh, and perhaps accelerating this year. Um, but the supply dropping, at some point you have a, uh, you have a parabolic rise because there's, there's just no more Bitcoin to buy, so the price goes up. Mm, and right. uh, one thing that accelerated that this year was PayPal. When PayPal said that all 27 million other merchants can now um, you know, buy and sell uh, Bitcoin uh, through their PayPal account. They are now um, buying PayPal uh, is now buying more Bitcoin per day than the miners are selling globally. And there's two other institutions that also are buying more Bitcoin than is being sold by the miners globally. So the only other place to buy it from is people who already have it and they're not in a hurry to sell, which is why it's been going up. <laughs> the old supply demand uh, question, isn't it? That's that's correct. Yeah. Now, one of the interesting, um, uh, you know, thinking about the evolution of crypto, because we know that Bitcoin is what seventy percent of the total crypto the mar market. I think the total value yep. of the crypto market is probably just over a trillion now. Um, correct. US, um, but there are more than four thousand coins and sort of variants, right? Um, so mm -hmm. how do you make sense of the uh, constellation of cryptos? I mean, is it all really sure. the future of Bitcoin and Ethereum or what about the other players? Well, uh, you know, I would say you can pretty much disregard for the moment uh, the bottom, like, you know, 3,700 or so, <laughs> uh, because many of them launched and never did anything, right? I mean, uh, anyone can launch a cryptocurrency, um, but, you know, anybody can also put an app on the App Store. It doesn't mean it's going to be Angry Birds. And so it's, 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 you know, if you look at, um, uh, you know, the, mar the, the coin market cap, uh, uh, the top 100 coins are 90 something percent of the total value. Uh, obviously, Bitcoin is 70 percent. And then uh, Ethereum is, you know, 16 percent and then Tether. And then you keep going down from there. Uh, there's a couple of new ones that have been coming up. Uh, and, uh, you know, they have sort of royal uh, pedigrees. Uh, uh, Polkadot um, has burst into the top five, um, and they haven't even launched yet. <laughs> well, they were found, founded by Gavin Wood, who was one of the founders of Ethereum. And Cardano is in the top 10. They were founded by Charles Hopkinson, the former CEO of Ethereum. So typically, the the people who've innovated in the past, uh, other investors are interested in, well, they got a track record. What are they doing in the future? Just like when Steve Jobs went out, you know, left Apple and started Pixar. It's like, oh, okay, what's he up to? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And the other question that I've got is, you know, the central banks and central bank digital currencies, right? There's a lot of experimentation going on. Mm -hmm. uh, there have been a number of quite critical comments from central banks in the past about, you know, Bitcoin, you can't trust Bitcoin, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But it seems to me that there's now a real tussle between the decentralized crypto world and the central bank digital currency world. How do you see that playing mm -hmm. out? Sure, well, that's a fascinating development. Uh, you know, I think the central banks doth protest too much since uh, they, they obviously on their planning board have, uh, you know, it, it behooves them to have a centralized digital currency because they can collect taxes on what they can see and they can't see where all the printed money goes once it actually leaves the bank. Uh, you know, unless they put like homing devices on it, whereas uh, digital currency has a built in homing device. It's called your phone. Uh, and so uh, China, it doesn't surprise anyone is really the first one to kind of go fully forward with this because, uh, you know, they, they like uh, sort of uh, tracking where money goes so it doesn't uh, escape the borders. And, you know, they, they have typically liked uh, tracking where their people, what their people do and social credits and all these things. So it's, it's perfectly in line, but um, India has been, you know, looking at this as much as they say, oh, banks can't sell Bitcoin. And so, you know, governments are right now, you know, their central banks are in a world of hurt 
because they're kind of running out of money to print without debasing their currency too much. And that's why you see property values and commodities growing. And that's why you see the price of Bitcoin uh, growing as well. Mm, right. Among other reasons. Yeah. Well, well, we'll come on to the price of Bitcoin uh, towards the end of our conversation. But just just on this central bank digital currency angle, um, you know, it seems to me that uh, there is a question of control, as, as you say, because obviously central banks want to keep control on their currencies and want to know where it is and the trackability and all those things are are part of what they're thinking about. Um, do you, do you see the coexistence potentially of central bank digital currencies and other decentralized cryptos, or do you think there's going to be an outright war with one between the other? No, no, absolutely. Because once you have a, uh, I mean, you have to let it out of the wallet or else you can't buy anything with it, no. right? And so it, it would behoove countries to be able to, uh, you know, allow their dollar. I mean, if they already allow their USD through. Um, through the SWIFT system or their euro or their RMB to be on an exchange, why wouldn't they uh, allow their version of Tether? I mean, they're actual fully backed by the government that they can print as much as they want hmm. uh, to be allowed to be, you know, exchanged for other cryptocurrencies. At that point, all of a sudden, everybody has a wallet. Everybody can buy Bitcoin. You have a hundred percent adoption in a country that has uh, a wall with the, uh, you know, a, a wallet, and all of a sudden, you also get people familiar with it, so that it's not into them anymore. And so, but there's a, there's a lot of innovation going on. There's at least fifty um, uh, countries right now that are actively investigating uh, having uh, uh, you know d digital currencies. Um, one of the companies I advise is called Temptum, and they're putting together um, you know uh, digital currency for a number of these countries. And there's a number of other ones out there. Uh, bit out of uh, Barbados. I mean, there's a number of ones that are handling part of the uh, problem, whether it's creating the cryptocurrency. Because you look at a country like, you know, Vietnam, let's let's take away the, the selfish reasons of wanting to just tax the death out of everybody um, and to eliminate, you know, dark money. Um, they've got problems because they're putting all these regulations on their private banks to the point that somebody can't get a bank account. Um, but yet they want to go and say, give you know, disability checks, so they want to go and uh, give COVID relief checks. And 85% of your population is unbanked. What do you do? Well, if you have a digital currency, you can just simply program it and send it to everybody's uh, uh, cell phone. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's a lot more efficient. A whole new road of efficiency and, and flexibility and agility, I guess. And one of the things that uh, I think is also very interesting, Mark Carney, when he was at the uh, the Bank of England, gave a speech at Jackson Hole a couple of years ago suggesting that, you know, the US dollar was effectively the reserve currency, but that may not be there forever. And maybe the next reserve currency will be a digital alternative. Um, does that play into your, your observations in terms of the evolution of the market? Well, uh, you know, the sort of the chatter coming out of the World Economic Forum and the IMF, et cetera, has been that perhaps the next Bretton Woods um, will have a basket of international currencies and, uh, you know, so that might be sort of a global uh, stable coin. Mm. Uh, they haven't obviously, and, and that would make some sense, right? So in other words, the global stable coin, not Bitcoin, because they want to have it, you know, sort of a fixed uh, number, just like, you know, people in the US look up and they do business in Europe, they say, all right, a, a dollar is worth this much of Australian dollar, this much worth of RMB, this much worth of Hong Kong dollar, this much worth of uh, EU, uh, the Euro. Um, so everybody would just look and say, you know, we're going to go and say the universal, you know, whatever you call it, the uh, unit of currency, the IMF dollar, we'll call it, um, you know, is worth like, you know, a dollar four from the U.S. or 96 cents for the euro. And they'll they'll sort of solidify what goes in it and, uh, uh, you know, how much you get to print each year. I mean, that would uh, put some reins on, on folks. I mean, the EU certainly has had its issues in terms of uh, having a euro be worth just as much in you know, a poorer country uh, in the EU than it is in a rich country. And, you know, uh, Greece versus uh, Finland has been uh, battled quite a bit, uh, you know, during some of the budget discussions. Mm, absolutely. Well, let's come back then to Bitcoin and, you know, the current journey of Bitcoin, because obviously the value has shot up quite recently. Uh, I spoke to Harry Dent earlier on today and his view was it could go higher, but it's definitely going to come back before it really takes off. Um, what's your perspective on the current trajectory of, of Bitcoin at the moment? Well, um, I sort of follow the uh, the cycles and the cycles, just like there's about a 10 year cycle in the stock market. 
uh, where you have slow run up and then a big crash. Um, and then, you know, the governments jump in and print more money and they start over again after there's blood in the streets. Um, it's, it's, it's almost the uh, reverse with Bitcoin. It's a four year cycle. And instead of a slow run up, you have a slow meltdown. You typically, most of your gains in Bitcoin are, are in the summer period. So there's four seasons and they, they correspond to the four years between the halving events. And it's uh, the year of the halving, we'll call Bitcoin spring. The year after is Bitcoin summer when you have this rising demand, but half the new supply and prices at some point go parabolic. They usually overshoot it because that's when the retail crowd cuts in and says, oh, my friend just doubled their money on Bitcoin. I better buy now before it goes higher and they get crushed, right? Whereas the professionals are selling at that point because they got in a year earlier. Um, and then you end up having, it doesn't crash all at once. It's usually, you know, sort of three cycles now. It's been sort of a slow meltdown and then you end up bottoming out, you know, perhaps you know, end of, uh, in this cycle, you know, my projection is that we'll hit the all-time high for Bitcoin, probably about the summer of this year, uh, the new all-time high, at least 100,000. Uh, and then you're going to start slowly going down. It might bubble up again. You'll have some recoveries and then it keeps slowly letting the air out of the, t out of the balloon. And then by the end of the year, it might be, you know, down by more than half at least. And then, and then, and then by the start of the other year, it could get down historically over 80%. But if you're 200,000 and you're down 80% and it's 40,000, you're only crying if you bought a 200,000 or a hundred thousand. And uh, you have to understand the cycles if you're buying, you know, this, this late in the game. Um, but uh, for this year, you're not late as long as you're prepared to uh, buy now and sell most of it, you know, end of this year. And then, you know, take the cash and wait for it till it's on sale again about a year and a half later. And, uh, you know, you, you have to you, you can't predict the exact date. So you'd have to pay attention to it, but not day trading, just sort of, uh, you know, take a look at uh, have alerts go off. Right. And so that cyclicality you're talking about is less to do with the quantitative easing and the very low interest rates. It's more to do with the fundamental uh, dynamics of the way that the Bitcoin uh, halving works. Is that what you're saying? Correct. Just like with the stock market, um, you know, two things have been pretty predictable is that there are about 10 year bull markets and then mm. a crash for about a year and a half. And mean, meanwhile, news goes on wars and everything else that, you know, sort of accelerate a bull market or accelerate a crash. Um, but the fundamentals of their 10 year cycle, and for whatever reason, I guess just people going on vacation uh, during during the uh, the summer to the Hamptons or the south of France, uh, I've always followed when I was in the stock market, sell in May and go away. So you sell your whole portfolio in May and, and then you buy it back after uh, the tumult that usually happens in September or October and you rebalance it. That kept me completely out of the stock market in 08, 09, because I looked up in November and said, oh, I don't want any of that yet. And then I bought back in when it, there was blood in the streets. And so you know, use a similar philosophy with uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, cryptocurrency, you know, watch the cycles, see that they repeat and, uh, you know, buy, buy when there's blood in the streets and uh, take some profits when it's, uh, you know, when there's a, when there's a market manias. Mm, right. So the secret is keep an eye on it, watch it very closely, but also just be a little bit cautious and careful as well to understand that there is actually an overarching set of momentums also happening. Correct. Mm. Well, Michael, I really appreciate your, your time today. That's been a fascinating insight um, from somebody who's absolutely steeped in this whole crypto world. My own perspective is I think the future is going to be, uh, you know, fantastically digital, literally. And uh, I think that we are in the very early footsteps of the foothills of where this is going to go. I'm not sure I can predict the future yet, but it's certainly to me more than just uh, a speculative bubble. There is something very fundamental here. Yes, I, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think that uh, uh, cryptocurrency public blockchains, as you will, if you will, um, are going to be the glue that holds all the other things and monetizes it and makes sense out of it. Because a lot of things that you couldn't do before broadband during the dot com crash became giant companies once you could do broadband. And I believe that a lot of things that you couldn't do without a means to pay for it that didn't go through the banks will become gigantic once you can just program in the uh, payment structure mm -hmm. globally. Yep. And that global, global, global reach, um, the instantaneous nature of it, and of course, the friction free nature of it. That's the other thing that's just worth um, underscoring mm -hmm. as we close, isn't it? Because if you think about the way that uh, transferring money today costs, well, in this digital world, it costs almost nothing. 
Correct. And um, yeah, I mean, you know, when I send $50,000 of Bitcoin to someone, I mean, the fees are higher than they used to be, but they're still going to be maybe four or five dollars. Mm. And then it goes through in, you know, 10 minutes and it could be $50 million in the same fee would pretty much apply or not much more. Yep. Well, that's appreciate your time. And just to underscore, you will be debating with Harry Dent uh, Thursday, the 28th of January, uh, Sydney time, um, specifically on the question of will the Bitcoin bubble burst or not. And I think what's interesting is having spoken to both of you, there's some really interesting commonality, but also some quite different opinions. Well, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. And I'll put the links in below and people can register for free. So thanks for your time today. I really appreciate yep. it. OK, thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye -bye.